In 1936, King Edward VIII abdicated from the throne of the United Kingdom in order, as he put it, to marry the woman he loved. The woman he loved was Wallace Simpson, who was then still married, although her divorce was in the works. And, to make it worse, she had been divorced once previously. Whereas the acts of succession of the 18th century more or less laid down who could be monarch, the lucky winner needs to be a Protestant believing in the Holy Trinity. As far as the wife of the monarch is concerned, Henry VIII's treason act made it a crime to have had a sexual relationship with a future wife of the king. So if any of you blokes out there have had a quick one with Camilla, I would keep it to yourself if I were you. In the 1970s, when Prince Charles was the most eligible bachelor on the planet, he had to find a woman who was obviously of aristocratic background, Protestant believing in the Holy Trinity, and sexually inexperienced, which meant that of all the ladies in the world, probably Diana was the only candidate. To come back to Edward VIII, his problem was that as a monarch, he would be the head of the Church of England, which then did not permit divorcees to remarry if the former partner was still alive. And of course, a registry office wedding for the king just would not do. To add to his problems, the Prime Minister Stanley Baldwin thought that the public would not accept a divorcee and that he had, by law, to get permission from dominions on anything of constitutional importance of this type. After all, King Edward was their king too. Eamon de Valera of Ireland said he couldn't care less. The Prime Minister of New Zealand said he'd never heard of Wallace Simpson, but the Prime Ministers of Australia and South Africa both said no. Baldwin gave the King three choices, either give up Wallace Simpson, marry her and cause a constitutional crisis, or abdicate, and then he could do whatever he wanted. He did the latter. Edward was born on the 28th of June 1894. As heir to the throne, he was expected, like Charles many years later, to do his duty, get married to the appropriate lady, produce an heir himself, and do what he was told and be a good king. His younger brother George had produced two daughters, Elizabeth and Margaret. Edward was in his 40s and had had a number of relationships with mainly married women. It appears usually with the consent of the husband. Thelma Furness, correctly known as Viscountess Furness, was married to Marmaduke Furness. He, as the first Viscount of Furness, is where she got her title from. She married Marmaduke in 1926 and started a relationship with Edward in 1929. They even went on holiday together. Whether or not this bothered Marmaduke, I cannot say. However, when Thelma went away, she asked her friend Wallace Simpson to look after the prince in her absence, which she did. And we all know how that ended up. Thelma came back and wanted the prince back, but Wallace would not give him back. And Edward did not want to go back. In my opinion, this is a bit like somebody looking after your dog uh, when you go away and then doesn't want to give the dog back. Anyway, at the time, Wallace Simpson was married to Ernest Aldrich Simpson. He was born in New York City on the 6th of May 1897 and was a graduate of Harvard. His father was Ernest Louise Simpson. He was British and Jewish and had co-founded the global shipbroking firm Simpson, Spence & Young. His mother was Charlotte Woodgrain Gaines, an American, the daughter of a New York City attorney. Shortly after Harvard, he came to the United Kingdom, took up British nationality, resigning on his American nationality, 
got a commission in the Coldstream Guards and fought in World War I. This, I think, shows a great deal of loyalty to the United Kingdom. I mean, to come to a country which is at war, uh, and you'd have known how bad that war was, but he did it anyway. This is Ernest Simpson in 1923, looking, in my opinion, very American. He met his first wife in the United States, but divorced her in 1928 in order to be with Wallace. Wallace also divorced her first husband in order to be with him. So clearly the marriage of the Simpsons was one based on love for each other, even if it did start with infidelity. They were married in the registry office in Chelsea. They got a flat in Mayfair in London where they had servants to look after them. They were financially well off until the stock market crash of 1929, although he had various business interests which allowed them to keep their heads above water even if they did have to let some of the staff go. At the same time Wallace started looking after the prince, she was therefore still happily married. So why did Mr Simpson permit this situation? It was not unusual for the members of the ruling establishment to allow the heir to the throne to borrow their wives. Prince Charles was particularly noted for this type of behaviour in the 1970s, where he could go out hunting or something like that, and where he had what was termed a comfort stop at somebody's house with somebody's wife. Mr. Simpson may have been well off financially, but he was hardly an establishment figure. A secret police report on him noted that Ernest Aldridge Simpson is bragging to the effect that he expects to get high honours before very long. He is very talkative when in drink. Therefore, Maybe he was counting on royal patronage in the future. Ernest Simpson had met the Prince of Wales, and uh, the Prince of Wales was even a visitor uh, to the couple's apartment. Now, once everything came out of the relationship between the two, he told of an emotional meeting with King Edward at which the king broke down after saying that he was in love with Simpson's wife. Now, whereas there is an establishment tradition of loaning out one's wife to the heir to the throne, there's no mention of handing her over on a permanent basis. Simpson called him mad. However, the Prince of Wales was not the only person Wallace Simpson was seeing. She had another lover, Guy Marcus Trundle, car salesman from York who was married and was then living at 18 Bruton Street in Mayfair in London. When it was clear that Wallace Simpson was in a relationship with Edward, her movements were monitored by the police. Clearly she was a potential security risk. The police believed that she did not want to lose the affection of the Prince of Wales for financial reasons and was careful about her movements, presumably the Prince of Wales was not informed of the police invigilation. Correspondence between Wallace and her husband in 1936, in the lead up to and after the divorce, indicates that she still loved him and the man she wanted to be with was her second, not her third husband. She clearly indicated that she wanted to return to him and to be with him. His correspondence, however, with his family shows that after everything that had happened, he could not have been happy with her. However, he loved her so much that he pretended that he'd been unfaithful in order for her to have the grounds to divorce him, accepting all the blame. This, of course, collusion between two parties in a divorce case was illegal. I get the impression that Wallace Simpson did not know what she wanted. This photograph shows him on a board a ship on the 1st of November 1936, just after the divorce hearing in Ipswich, 
and just before the abdication crisis hit. Whereas Edward VIII was besotted by Wallace, it seems as though the degree of love he felt for her was not returned. They were married in 1937 after the divorce of Wallace came through. Wallace, it appears, became lonely. She could no longer have the active social life she had enjoyed in London and she was more or less exiled to the Bahamas as the governor's wife alongside her husband during World War II. Many of their pre-marriage friends turned out to be pseudo-friends and deserted them. The prince was very unhappy that members of his family did not attend his wedding. Nonetheless, he did spend the rest of his life with the woman he loved, supported by cash handouts from his brother, King George VI, and from renting royal residences for use by the royal family. Mr. Simpson went on to have two more wives. His third wife died of cancer, aged only 45 in 1941. After the death of his third wife, he married again. He died in London in 1958, aged only 61. His second wife, Wallace, wrote to him until he died. So I hope you found that interesting. This is a bit different from the sort of thing I normally do. And this happened uh, as I was preparing a video on the visit of Wallace and Edward to Nazi Germany in 1937, which Wallace found tedious, but Edward found really inter interesting. And of course, unlike his visits to South Wales and the northeast of England during the Depression in Nazi Germany, he saw uh, what they allowed him to see. And if I ever finish writing that one, you can uh, uh, see it if you, and you'll know when it comes out if you subscribe. Now, there's a final point. This is something personal to me and I can't understand it, but um, maybe other people can. Um, how is it that establishment figures seem to place so much on getting an honour? Um, obviously, it's totally unrealistic for me to get knighted or something like that, so maybe I just can't... Uh, Feel it. I mean, if I were to get an email from the Queen and the Queen said, um, look, Alan, I'd like to uh, give you a knighthood on such and such a date. Uh, maybe, you know, if I was going to be in London or I had nothing else planned, then maybe I'd, I'd go there for it. But would I make a special journey? Well, I say now I wouldn't do now. Of course, it's unrealistic. Anyway, what I would like to know is, would any of you lend out your husband or your wife in return for an honour. Put your answers below.